Okay, we're here on Antelope Island in the Great Salt Lake, a fantastic state park uh, here in northern Utah. And we've come up this ridge. This is part two of a four-part series, working my way up this ridge and making a transect of some of these different rock types we encounter um, along this ridge here on the east side of the island. This large outcrop just below me here is what I featured in part one the Farmington Canyon complex, the metamorphic, highly deformed metamorphic and intrusive igneous rocks that form the oldest rocks in this area at about 1.8 billion years. So we're gonna, we've actually come up the hill and just as I was working my way, way, way up from that outcrop, the rocks changed a little bit. Now, they look somewhat similar in overall color, but those very intensely deformed metamorphic rocks, um, we don't see anymore here. So I'm going to take you into this next rock unit and this may be one of my favorite rock layers here on Antelope Island. Not so much because of it, how it looks or its appearance, but more so the story that it tells. It tells a really fascinating story that almost defies outright logic. So come with me up this hill here. We'll get to some of these bigger outcrops. We can see the rocks are overall dark in color various shades of gray, green, purples. And let's walk our way up to this exposure of this little cliff face here. And we'll start with some observations and see what we can learn from this. So right away, we can see this is very different than the rock we looked at in part one in the basement rocks, the ancient Proterozoic rocks. For context, these rocks are much younger. So between that knob that I hiked past just down here and this location, we crossed a major boundary, a major contact between the rocks and unconformity. These rocks here are anywhere from about 720 to 650 million years, uh, a time period uh, called the Proterozoic, the end of the Proterozoic and also sometimes called the Neo-Proterozoic. But let's start making some observations here. We can see that this unit is composed of a variety of rock fragments of various shapes and sizes. Uh, if we look in closely here, we can see a lot of these may be igneous or metamorphic in terms of uh, their characteristics. If we look at the sizes of them, let's see if we can find the biggest one. I can see here, um, just in this outcrop, some of these class or particles are approaching, you know, football size, um, maybe a little bit larger. There's some other places on the island where they're almost a meter in diameter, three feet or so. So we can see that the sizes varies considerably from very small particles to much larger ones. If we focus a little bit on the shape of these particles, they tend to run the gamut. There are some that are somewhat rounded overall, uh, but then there's others over here is one that's almost triangular with a real sharp point there. So some are quite angular. So we're seeing a, a wide variety of classed shapes and sizes. Here's a piece of quartz in here, some more igneous material. Um, just a real hodgepodge mixture of class sizes and shapes. Um, so we've made some observations here. Let's see if we can come up with an identification of these rocks. Now, using the um, some of the tools and skills that I've outlined in my rock identification with Wilsey series, it'd be a tough call here. If you decided these were all mostly rounded in shape, you would call this a conglomerate. If it contained all exclusively angular particles, we would call it a breccia. Um, and I think we're seeing a mixture here. And as geologists, what we tend to do is to be a breccia, things need to be pretty much all angular in terms of the, the overall shape of those rock particles or clasts. So we might be uh, prone to call this a conglomerate. However, this is a special type of sedimentary rock. This is actually called a diamictite. So a diamictite is basically a conglomerate, but one that has uh, a very muddy matrix. If we look at the actual um, material, 
that surrounds the rock particles, we can see that it's incredibly fine-grained. Um, we can also see that the matrix or the uh, muddy material um, is the dominant component. This rock is mostly this mud-sized particles particle and then we have these big chunks in it. It's almost like a chocolate chip cookie where we've got the cookie dough, the fine grain material, and then that's punctuated by these larger particles just like your chocolate chips uh, in the cookie there. Um, so um, that's the that's the way these rocks look. Let's walk a little bit further um, and then let's see if we can decipher the story here. Now what makes these rocks really interesting and compelling is that we find similar rocks to this diamictite in other locations in rocks of the same age. So when we look at rocks um, from the Neoproterozoic, some from the same time frame, on all continents we find these same units. Um, and collectively they're telling us a story about a time frame in Earth's history that's almost unprecedented. It's a time frame known as Snowball Earth. Basically, the idea is these rocks had to have been laid down by a glacier. It's the only mechanism that could move such large particles. There's other evidence that suggests this, because there actually are some other processes that might move rocks of this size. But in places, there's also drop stones, which are actually uh, rocks that melt out of icebergs, hit the muddy bed of the ocean or body of water beneath them, and then create a little uh, depression where those drop in. Um, and so collectively, the evidence for these diamictites that we see, these Neoproterozoic diamictites, is that, it, it, is that there was glaciers um, across the earth at pretty much all latitudes. So if we reconstruct the continents for that time period, we had a large supercontinent called Rodinia. And during this time frame, about 650 to 720 million years ago, Rodinia was starting to break up. It was starting to fragment, but it was mainly concentrated. The land masses were mainly in the low latitudes near the equator and then a little bit further north on either side. And so, um, again, this idea is of snowball earth is that once you get ice forming, so if you think about when you get snow in your yard, ice is incredibly reflective. And so um, it's something we call albedo. So by allowing ice to encroach further south during a cold time in Earth's history, at some point you can cover so much of the continents with ice that it creates a positive feedback loop. You, you've covered so much of the land with ice that now the solar radiation hits that ice. Most of it reflects, reflects back out into space and that allows the ice to grow further and further and further and sort of uh, perpetuate itself over time. Um, so these snowball earth deposits are just really, really fascinating. Uh, only found in you know a scattered few locations, but here on Antelope Island, uh, they're spectacularly exposed. There's a few other places in the Wasatch, southeastern Idaho. You can also see these in parts of Death Valley, uh, and then they're again they're found on other continents as well. Um, but we're going to go look at next. We'll work our way up the ridge, and in part three, what we'll do is look at the unit that caps this. So for now, we'll sign off with a good view of are diamictites, these neoproterozoic uh, uh, units, these glacial deposits, as the ice was carrying all these sediments and dropping them uh, along their margin here on Antelope Island. So we'll see you a little further up the ridge here for part three.